Good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on where from in the Americas you are. Welcome to this webinar, uh, which is entitled Disaster Readiness and Response, sponsored by the IAI and also Amazon Web Services. I am Juan Carlos Montoya. I am the Digital Transformation Leader for Canada and the Americas and AWS. And it is a pleasure for me to lead this webinar today. Before we begin, I would like to tell you that with, uh, we have interpretation, uh, but the second presentation will be in English and the interpretation channel is available through this on this QR code. And it will also be available in the chat where you can find the link. Uh, today's session, we will have uh, interpretation available. The first part of the agenda is in, in Spanish. So if you require English translation, please uh, access uh, the interpretation channel at this uh, QR or follow uh, the link at the chat. Uh, the final session will be held in English. So if you need interpretation into Spanish, please use the QR code or have a look at the link in the chat. Today, uh, we will have an introduction to the cloud, its benefits. We will be uh, welcoming Marcus Regida Silva, the executive director of the IAI, and we will be talking about some uh, use cases on the topic. So that with without further ado, dear Marcos, would like to welcome you. Thank you for being here and being part of this webinar. Thank you, Juan Carlos. It's a, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, I would first like to thank all the panelists for their contributions uh, to this webinar, but also Amazon Web Services and NASA for their assistance in the organization of the seminar. Uh, Latin American and the Caribbean find themselves in a very peculiar space with regard to scientific research. We have incredible human capacity, and in fact, many of our scientists are lead authors in IPCC and IPBES reports. Uh, we have some superb universities. We have some very good scientific capacity. However, that capacity is under tremendous strain because of a number of cuts across the board that the region has faced because of some very difficult social and economic uh, conditions that the entire uh, community of nations is currently facing. The II has implemented an emerging issues program to introduce countries, governments, and its scientific community to all new technologies, scientific methodologies, and trends that may be of benefit in efforts to increase institutional capacities to better undertake scientific research. Computation in the cloud, cloud computing, is one of these new technologies. And I am very, very pleased that we have the opportunity to have such renowned experts to explain, present, and also present many projects that are currently using uh, these technologies. Our hope, at least from the IAI's point of view, is that well, this webinar will see new collaborations with Amazon, with NASA, with other players in the field, and provide our community of scientists the very needed resources that they may so need. So these words, Juan Carlos, again, many thanks for all the participants, Many thanks for all the attendees, and I guess we can begin. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos, for the uh, introduction and for being with us in this webinar. As Marcos has said, let us now briefly introduce the uses and benefits of implementing cloud services, and then we will have some uh, examples as provided by experts and also practical uh, application examples. Okay, please let me share my screen. Okay, so let us now begin with the basics. What's the cloud? 
And by definition, the cloud is uh, on-demand resources and IT resources on the internet by paying as you go. So instead of purchasing and maintaining your own data and server centers, organizations and individuals can now purchase a technology, for instance, storage capacity, computing capacity, and other data databases and other services as needed. And this is a way, another way to see this is using, for instance, energy use in our homes. For instance, at home, we pay electricity depending on what we use. When we turn on the lights, we pay for that electricity. And when we don't need it anymore, then we, we turn off the, the switch and we stop paying. We're not charged for the, the time when we're, not when we're not using electricity. The same goes for the cloud. Now, I would like to give you more details about comparing traditional infrastructure and cloud infrastructure and its advantages. First of all, agility. This allows AWS clients to quickly activate resources as they need them. This means that they can implement new applications uh, very quickly. This means that they can also innovate and experiment uh, more efficiently. If something goes wrong, it's also flexible enough to scale down the resources with no risk. The second advantage has to do with cost saving. Usually this is the main reason why clients turn to AWS in order to significantly reduce the costs. So the cloud allows uh, clients to uh, exchange to change the uh, the main capital and now they have different type of spending. In the case of um, IT, it changes. And also there are the scale, uh, economics of scale as provided by AWS. The third reason is elasticity. This is very important because we can expand and reduce or scale down uh, the costs because we can determine how much we need and also we can also determine the workload. At some point through the year, we have a workload peaks where we need uh, when we need a lot more support. And, and during those times, elasticity allows us to increase technical needs. Also, when we don't have such a high workload, we can be, you know, flexible and scale down the resources. That leads to cost reduction and improves the client's capacity to meet the user's needs. Advantage number four we can innovate uh, uh, more quickly. And this allows us to make the most of uh, valuable human uh, capital and time resources. And, and this is a case of the webinar. And we don't have to, I don't know, solve uh, technical issues such as problems with uh, servers, etc. It also allows us to uh, implement a global deployment in minutes. Have a look at our global infrastructure. This is the AWS global infrastructure. It is the strongest available. Why, why is it important to have global infrastructure? In this case, research is not limited to a number of countries or certain areas. There is a cooperation, especially within research, because there is always a global collaboration within research. And this solid global infrastructure network allows for this uh, collaboration. And it also ensures uh, equitable access to data. And you can access data faster and more easily. And also, there is better access to more public databases. And also, it is no longer necessary to replicate data, which happens quite a lot. Uh, this really caught my attention when I heard it the first time. Analysts predict that in the next five years, we are going to 
uh, create more than twice the data than those created since the beginning of the digital era. So in the last in the next five years, we will be creating more data than in the last 30 or 40 years. This is quite impressive and is increasing exponentially uh, because all services are now becoming digital and also our systems. Therefore, if we're going towards uh, data use growth, the current uh, uh, IT, limited IT resource system uh, makes no sense. We can see that things are much faster now, and we see that server, local servers have problems uh, or other IT tools are now limited given the growing uh, number of data. This means that researchers and universities are also limited in this regard. This is connected with, you know, needing more databases with further storage, better um, computing resources, and this has to do with the high data creation rates that we have. And I think we need to talk about elasticity as well. When we have high demand, then the cloud elasticity allows us to adapt to such a circumstance. Another main advantage of the cloud is its uh, security. Uh, uh, investment in cybersecurity increased 34% in 2022 compared to 2021. Kaspersky records 4,000 uh, daily ransomware attacks in Latin America. So this new reality shows us that we, you know, we need to do something about physical security, but also we need to have cybersecurity measures in place, especially when we need to protect something that is so valuable, uh, such as our research. And the cloud is much safer in this regard. Okay, let's recap. The cloud is more agile, it reduces costs, it, it allows us to innovate more quickly, it provides us with elasticity. It provides us with global uh, access infrastructure, and it's also, uh, it, it provides us with security. But also the, the cloud, and the cloud is green, it allows us to reduce CO2 emissions. And the cloud transition is 80% greener than uh, maintaining the, the traditional type of infrastructure. Hopefully in the next few, a few years, we will be reaching 96% in the case of AWS cloud and its capacity to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. This will be the case in 2025 when AWS becomes 100% um, or is uses uh, renewable energies in 100% of its operations. And nowadays the cloud is greener and it's a better alternative. And at AWS, we're very proud and make a huge effort regarding sustainability. Uh, one of the main ones is that we have a pledge towards the Paris Climate Change uh, Agreement and its target is 2050. At Amazon, we're going to achieve this uh, 10 years earlier by 2040. That's our commitment. There is also a water initiative, and hopefully by 2030, we will be able to give water back to the communities, more water than what we are using. You know, give water back to communities. And by 2025, as I was saying, we uh, aim for Amazon to ha to use 100% renewable energy. And in this ca case, the cloud would be 96% sustainable. And also regarding its use of renewable energy. So this is five years before the original 2030 plan. So, this was a brief message that aimed to provide you with some ideas about the cloud, its applications, 
uh, specifically regarding researchers and universities. So once again, we are saving time. So um, researchers can easily get on the cloud and launch something in a, uh, in a shorter time than uh, traditional than the, the traditional way. It also reduces costs dramatically because it allows us to, you know, uh, save costs, but at the same time, the costs can be reflected uh, or seen in other areas where people also want to progress. Flexibility is also very important because it allows us to uh, reduce our use needs regarding storage or computing, depending on the varying uh, workloads, as is the case generally throughout the year. Uh, you know, what, so we have different types of workloads throughout the year, and the cloud provides us with this elasticity and flexibility. And also we have a very solid network that enables the ex uh, data exchange and makes it easier for researchers to communicate. So thank you very much for your attention. Let us now go back to our agenda. It is an honor to introduce Irene. Irene, can you hear us? Thank you, Ricardo, here I am. Welcome, Irene. Irene will be moderating this section. Now we will have Ricardo Quiroga. He will be talking about the uh, response readiness program at NASA. He will be talking about a, a practical case regarding the use of the cloud. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos and Ricardo. I don't know if you're going to turn on your camera and by the Meantime, I can introduce Ricardo, who will present about the program of preparation of respect of the NASA. And he is the uh, Mary Geo Disasters Co-Chair and NASA Disasters Americas Coordinator, who works in the subject of re disaster reduction in the Americas. He's a cooperator, a coordinator, a coordinator of the disaster program of the NASA for the Americas. And and he has uh, that has the objective of improving the use of satellite and NASA products for the reduction of disaster risk. Thank you very much. Uh, can I please share my screen? Thank you. Just a second, I'll save this to show you my screen. Can you confirm that you can see my screen, please? Yes, we can see it. Perfect, thank you. So let's start. I have as a goal to present in 10 minutes, just a brief summary of what our program does and what I'll show in the presentation is the idea is to have these 10 minutes and give you an idea of what we do at the NASA and what uh, how that is connected to the cloud. First, to give you a context of what we're doing as NASA, in some areas and is trying to inform the whole community about climate change and for that purpose there is an application all of this is online and that has the variables in close to real time of the planet we see the air temperature production of carbon uh, carbon production at the level of the sea and the data that is shown here are reflected as the most recent. Here we have soil information, humidity, the ozone layer. This is another one of the soil and this is a zone layer and the difference of the gravitational fields of the planet and also underground water. And we have an application that allows to see the visible Spectre of the of the Earth and uh, all the satellites that are in satellite missions of the NASA are providing information right now, and all of this will will show us the data and will take us to the satellite as such. I don't want to 
go for very long with this. I just, just wanted you to know that this satellite was launched 147 years ago, and we can see here in the visible Earth some disaster events such as a cyclone, Tenesum. This is a recent cyclone, a tropical system. And here you have the photograph. I don't want to speak for very long about that, but I would like to show you on this platform how the missions are organized, the current satellite missions of NASA that are providing data constantly so that they are accessible to all the users. We have Aqua with one of the oldest satellites that we have, and we have the Earth satellite. 23 years and some uh, other satellite as a SWAT, which is a new satellite that is 48 hours at, from launch. And this satellite allows us to give data about topography of the oceans, trying to show the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere concerning climate change. And these missions provide a lot of data that are very interesting and that will allow us eventually to have a vision of data in real time of what's happening. Now we have the ISAT, which is a laser altimeter. We have the system of global precipitation because this is a source of the data. Each one is equipped with sensors that generate data that will be stored here. I would like to show this that here are the future missions, missions such as the radar mission. This is a radar mission, but I don't want to take a lot of time with that and I will have to continue my presentation. What I would like to give you is a context of where the whole system of systems of NASA comes from. We try to understand the Earth as a system, as a systemic planet. And the idea is how this can be provided as applications for the users, technology, flights, analysis of research and analysis, data and computer, and it becomes applications. If we can't do this, we will have wasted a lot of time and money if we don't use this data for mechanisms of transmission that are reliable, fast, and especially efficient when finding the data. This is a model of animation of the precipitation system of the NASA. Of the NASA. And this is a satellite that 45 years ago, 45 days ago in November. The Hitsbury is a new satellite that works in infrared and spectral images, base that works on plankton and aerosols to study the interaction between the atmosphere and the Earth. And this is space. This one is also still working. And then there's also tropics, which is working on rain together with NASA. These are six satellites that are providing valuable information. In order to uh, better study rain data. Here we have, this is, you know, the concept of tropics, these data satellites. And this is what NASAR, this is NASAR, it's a satellite that will be launched next year, but will also have a high volume of data, especially the idea that we have now is to have it available in the disaster portal of the NASA. We are in the phase of developing the interaction so that it can map and develop these web mapping services, which have not been developed yet, but it can be visualized, but you cannot work with the data yet. So after NICER, there will be a lot of application with biomass, but also for flooding information about the terrain. And all of this takes us to the 
data search system, Earth data of the NASA, large volume of NASA data is here. It can be searched in different types of data, real time data, this system of images, global images and hot spots system. And by topics, you can search by atmosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, and other types of tools, but access to NASA data is there. And now NASA is promoting uh, open data, open science policy, and uh, so that the data is available for anybody in the world who can work with the data. And I will go back to the presentation. I'm jumping about with this, but I wish to show you that that is a repository, data repository, and there are a large number of images from all the satellites that are hosted here with the different search systems. Additionally, we have a mapping portal for disasters of the NASA, and it has three basic components that are the story maps. It's the, you can see the products that have been made from previous cases. These are real cases. Uh, the hurricane, in the case of AIDA, the, the hurricane AIDA, we can see, for example, some products that have been created. And you can learn and see here how the products have been combined to have a series of readings on the ground in the case of the, disaster. For example, here we have 200 cases that have been activated in this disaster portal. For example, here's a vision with black marble with the city lights of the New Orleans of New Orleans before the hurricane Ida. And this is afterwards. This is before in a nor lighted in a normal manner. And that's the impact of the hurricane. In this type of products, you can see in the disaster portal. And in addition to the story maps and these use examples, we also have a dashboard with the products so far. And we have a series of layers of tabs that we'll talk about tropical storms. And you can have a lot of layers of the trajectory, the precipitation amount, the wind, for speeds, and we have added some NASA products, such as the light mirth products, uh, precipitation accumulation products, and we can see also wind gusts, and we can see flooding. And something that I really like is the portal where we can see the landslides and the situation about landslides in the case of an event. And this is happening on the cloud and we have this uh, that data servers. And the idea with this portal is that, that it will be moved to the cloud completely and it will be a web mapping service and it will take a few months, but it will be available for everyone. And also in NASA, we're working with a disaster response center a completely new concept that will be announced in the next few weeks, two, three, four, five weeks, it will be announced, this new center. And it will be a pleasure to be able to share it with you and understand how this system will work. NASA's intention is to have a more robust system to support response in different aspects, both in the emergency agencies, humanitarian, attention. I will not talk anymore about that. This is a landslide model in the NASA. This is completely downloadable. It can be adjusted for the countries. It's a model that is available for you. And we have an example that these are the close to real time data about fires and identifying the hotspots. And this is being informed to the whole world community about the presence of possible fires. And there are different readings combined with the direction of the fire, the plume, the and other aspects. And there's a system that allows to identify 
the 20 years of the whole planet by country of 20 years of history, fire histories. And another one of the resources that we are developing is visualization. Excuse me, I've gotten lost here. I don't know what happened here. I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you perfectly, Ricardo. Yes, because I'm jumping from one screen to another. Yes, I would like to mention the, to the audience that if you have any questions, because it's a very interesting presentation, you can put them in the question and answer session and uh, Irene, the moderator, will send them to Ricardo. I would like to go back here. As part of the development, we are working on these types of visualizations, this 3D visualization of immersive type uh, to model scenarios of impact. That is what we try to understand here is to show the decision makers, a governor or an emergency manager, how affected the city can be. This is an example of a hurricane, a category one, two, three, and the, uh, up to category five, and we can show the 3D modeling, how the city may be affected, and this will allow a better decision making. And this can not be done without large data volumes. And the only way to manage it is to use cloud computing. And so we are developing this, this type of technologies and methodologies, but it promises to be very useful, especially for recreating impact scenarios. In the case, for example, of a hurricane or flooding, we also can do seismic modeling or landslides, etc. Finally, we can also have speed data, uh, city data for the 3D visualization of the possible impact of Threats. This is a seismic threat in the city of Guatemala. What you can see in yellow is uh, the system of faults of where the fractures can take place during an earthquake. And see, you can see what structures are exposed, and such. And you can measure the level of vulnerability or resistance of these structures, and who lives there, if whether there's people who are more vulnerable, older people, or or people or there are uh, areas that can be much more resilient. And this can be understood in another area of risk evaluation, such as including threat and exposure. I didn't want to make this too long because of the time we would, and I will be answering questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I'd like to go back to my camera. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And we are being asked whether we can show the laser of the laser of the different uh, the links of the different platforms. Could you show the central link where that would give them access to the different platforms? Yes. Actually, the presentation can be shared with everybody. I have already sent it to Juan Carlos and all the links are included there. Thank you very much. I can also send it to the chat. I'm a bit lost in the application. Oh no, I found it. Thank you. I can add it to the chat and that's it. Another question there is here is whether all that data is open data. Yes. This is a very good question. All the data, actually, I would like to tell you that NASA is developing a, an open science approach, more than open data, it's open science. And the research of, the, of NASA is, also, is working with open science. So it's open data, open algorithms, so that anybody in the world can uh, you, make use of all this data and it's all open and free. That's wonderful. And an additional question, is it possible to combine satellite data with data in situ? For example, 
data from sensors or drones, not only is it possible, but it is necessary. The resolution of the data satellites is a me middle medium level, but it's got to be combined with local data, especially socio-demographical data, also drone data, and even from local networks in the case of agriculture or forecasts, all types of sensors and much denser networks, it is better to combine those data and that is where it's much more useful. So more than possible, it's absolutely necessary to reach a decision making level from the satellite. We have a couple of minutes still, so a community of researchers is very diverse. Which do you think is the profile of the researcher that should start to explore the NASA data for research of disaster preparedness projects? Because there are researchers that are a bit afraid because they feel that they will not have the capacity. Well, yes, two things. One, more than one researcher. This is a team effort because it's a multidisciplinary, it requires a multidisciplinary approach because when we talk about systemic approaches, managing data in a systemic manner, we are talking about all the, a lot of disciplines involved. So a, there isn't an exact profile, but there are some research questions that are on the table uh, still to be resolved, for example, we are talking about early warning and it's very important to work on early warning and form decision politic policy making with data of early warning because the national policies are, have not been adjusted according to scientific evidence and so there is a big effort to be made. Also. The geospatial industry is now valued at $5 trillion. It will be $25 trillion, as Juan Carlos was saying. And in 2030, this will probably amount to $30 trillion. This means that it's an ever-growing industry and more people are joining the sector, you know, joining this industry. And there isn't just one profile. We need a multidisciplinary approach. And I think that everyone from their area needs to find a way to use data in a beneficial way. Or they might even find the right partner. Great, thank you. So this is the end of this section. Now I would like to give the floor to Camila Sad from AWS. Thank you, uh, Ricardo, again. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo and Irene for this in, uh, introduction. I am Camila Saad, as Irene was saying. I lead AW, the Readiness and uh, Disaster Response and Readiness Program for the Caribbean, Latin America, and Canada. The program was launched in 2020 as a service to strengthen uh, government readiness and response, also the readiness and response of uh, institutions and NPOs harnessing our expertise. Through the program, I've been privileged enough to work with AWS partners that are developing uh, early warning and detection solutions. This is why I am so happy to present Jose Luis Alvaro from TX Group. Uh, and they will be the panelists we will have. First of all, Jose Luis, uh, he will be talking about uh, a flood early warning system for floodings and rivers, and Nicolas will be talking about wildfire detection. This is possible thanks to the uh, AWS cloud services. If you have a question, please use the Q and A session within the GoToWebinar application. You'll find it on the right where it says questions. There you can include your questions. I will be monitoring the chat while our panelists uh, make their presentation. After each uh, session, after Jose Luis and Nicolas, I will be asking a few questions. If for, if for some reason we have no time to ask your questions, don't worry, because after the webinar, we can stay in touch 
by email and answer your questions. So without further ado, now I'd like to introduce Jose Luis Alvaro. He's a technology director at Grupo TX. Jose Luis, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Thank you. Please go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you, Camila. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for allowing us to present the solution we've been working on uh, with you. Can you see my screen? Yes, uh, not fully yet. Okay, here we can see your screen. Um, this is the system that we've been working on with AWS. First of all, uh, uh, who is Grupo Tetix? We are a group of companies that uh, focus on creating in innovative solutions. We aim for these solutions to align with our clients objectives. It was founded in 1984. We have over 500 uh, agreements entered into in Latin America. We are currently present in 15 countries and we have over 900 collaborators in consultancy and technology. We have been acknowledged for the tools that we have developed, you know, cloud uh, tools and also the Partners in Innovation Award uh, uh, for the Cloud Challenge. We were selected as Partner of the Year at the Public Sector for Central America and the Caribbean. We were also awarded the, in, uh, the Business Innovation Award, uh, awarded in Panama. We have been working with AWS for over 12 years. We have several programs um, together. Let us now uh, talk about our solution. Well, it integrates monitoring, forecast risk, uh, natural risk assessment, readiness activities, and significant information communication processes. This is done to be able to take timely action quickly and to uh, reduce risks uh, of floodings. This solution was made possible thanks to the work conducted of the AWS and Camila. Uh, the countries in our region uh, had a high uh, uh, flood risk in general, and this is what we noticed. The pilot program started with AWS and the National Civil Protection System from Panama, SINAPROC. Uh, they wanted to create an early warning monitoring system for the uh, Juan Diaz River. So now I'd like to talk about the river. The river has a high tidal inf influence and floods began to take place in this area. This is a very sensitive area in Panama, and it's uh, seriously affected by rainfall. It has a lot of rapids, falls and rapids throughout its area. It, its area is of 322 kilometers, and it is 28 kilometers long. The Juan Diaz River is the main river that uh, actually causes floodings in Panama. Uh, so far this year, there have been two flooding events in, in just one month, you know, and this is mainly due to the urban developments that affect mangroves, uh, forests, etc., and also why the, the the insufficient drainage system. There is also tidal influence in the low areas of the river, and also and also high precipitation levels. September, October, and November have the highest rainfall. And uh, but with climate change, this has shifted, and nowadays December and January are also included in this uh, um, rainy season. Uh, have a look at the course of the river. 
it, it, it runs through, you know, the city of Panama. As you can see, there are se several areas that are easily flooded in the high areas and up to the Pacific Ocean areas. These are several events with over the overflowing river, a home flooding. And there's something very interesting uh, in the case of this river because it has an area that easily floods, but it's also divided into several areas. And different types of events take place. There's also, have a look at this uh, important section of the river. Right now, we, we are in dry season, as you can see. But here we have a, an image showing what the chaos that is taking place during the rainy season. We wanted to show you these images because uh, before this project, the SINAPROC, the Civil Protection System in Panama, uh, used this place to monitor the river. They used a camera and a recording stand to check the, the river level. Currently, with our solution, what has been done is we have installed several sensors that are, for instance, meteorological station uh, sensors that are placed within the river basin. There are also two rain uh, gauges to check the rainfall levels at the basin. There are also high definition cameras that to check how the river is behaving. And finally, there are ultrasonic sensors that allow us to measure the river, uh, le the water level in different sections of the river. As you know, they only before they only took measurements at this point um, in this exact place of the river. But nowadays we are measuring uh, this, le this level in five, points so that we have a better idea of what happens in the river in the uh, lower section and the higher section. This information goes through uh, LoRaWAN networks through the cloud. When the data reach the cloud, as my colleagues were saying before, we use open data uh, and the, we have information from the Meteorological Institute of Panama. We use these data to uh, conduct an analysis and have a more comprehensive uh, study of the river. This allows us to have a record of the river, of the river's behavior, and the idea is to aid informed decision making. Um, this, these data are accessible to anyone uh, through the dashboard and cloud technology. This system also feeds the warning system. So there are SMS notifications or phone calls. Um, that report to the various response institutions that participate in the issue. In the future, the idea is to provide this information to the uh, citizens that want to receive it as well. We will be placing sirens in order to provide an auditory warning and uh, warn the, the inhabitants of the area. To do this, we need planning and we need to check all this with the community. Therefore, this project also includes a socialization and a community work process where 
citizens are told about the system and about the different types of warning they might get. Um, so they are also told what should they what they should do when they receive these warnings. Uh, which are the features of this solution? It's easy to install. River monitoring should be low cost. Maintenance should be simple as well. Uh, data collection should happen in real time as far as possible. This allows us to conduct a, a predictive analysis in order to prevent if these uh, you know, accidents. When compared to more traditional uh, river level measurement uh, systems or devices, we noticed that they, there was a, a high investment in equipment, in um, uh, high investment in ma maintenance, and also they needed a lot of staff from the different institutions because they needed to, you know, go to the site or conducting um, site studies at the different monitoring areas. The idea was to implement this massive is to implement this massively in every country. So the idea was to find sensors that were easily maintained. The sensors we use need to have the batteries replaced once every 10 years and also rain gauges. And the meteorological station needs to have the batteries replaced every one or two years. Therefore, maintenance um is really simple and it um it uh doesn't need any human intervention for a long time this makes it ideal for uh, distant places or uh rural areas or, or places that are hard to reach as we're also using lura one technology a, a remote implementation is much easier as well and using different devices so that the, the information can be uh, uploaded to the cloud without uh, the need for satellites uh, or mobile phones, because that would uh, require more battery power in order to transfer these data. This solution should be accessible for every country and it should help them minimize flooding risks but there's something else as we get the data uh, the idea is to help analyze the situation by you know informing the risk of droughts or other things also In the area, we need data or countries need data to protect their investment. Um, so the idea is to get the private sector to support these initiatives as well as the government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Luis, for your presentation. I think we do have time for one question. I'm making a note of the questions in order to answer them later. So one of the questions asked, I know this is difficult for you to understand. So we can have a final number. Could you give a final number? If you could give an estimate, it would be really good. We know it's difficult to give a definite figure. Well, the cost and the implementation of these projects, it's interesting that you need to do an initial analysis of the rivers and the basins uh, we wish to monitor, especially to determine where 
the sensor should be located and we do find currently we have three uh, we have the river that we have mentioned and there are three other places that we are about to implement in Panama and we have to study the historicals of all the situations and after the definition of the sensors it's something that is we could say economical for the usual processes we are talking here about around in this river in equipment we are talking about 20 to 30 thousand dollars with all the solution including the network of the Loba one which is what we can use another which we can use to monitor other rivers and then there is all the analysis and the information that you have uh, which varies a bit more but also seeking the viability of the project we are also trying to find a way to implement it ourselves as a grupo de x uh, so that you don't have to invest in other in countries and you can have our constant support and maintenance for the equipment etc thank you very much jose luis thank you so much several people were asking so as i said at the beginning i will make note of the questions and you, we will be answering to you by mail but we would like to now continue thank you very much jose luis for the presentation and as i said at the beginning it's a pleasure to work with grupo dx for thank you very much for the invitation and it's always very pleasant for us and it has been a great project thank you bye and now i would like to give the floor to nicolas nicolas as i mentioned at the beginning he's the ceo of dirmont dirmont is a business partner of w aws and nicolas urijon will tell you about his project concerning forest fire detection. You have the floor, Nicolas. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Camila, for the invitation and for letting us participate. And thank you, AIA, for the invitation. And I would like to have an access, the access so that I can share my screen and the presentation. Can you see, can you please confirm that you can see my presentation? I can see it. De detection, yes, yes, we can see it. Thank you very, everyone. And as the title says, we will be talking about ultra early detection of forest fires, a solution that we are offering. And we are very excited to talk about uh, together with Ryan, which is Dryad, which is a German company that has received many awards together with AWS. And as the speakers before me explained, Juan Carlos and the process of Power, processing power and the possibilities that the cloud offers for these types of solutions. And also Ricardo, who told us that the fires were a big scourge of the, from the environmental point of view and how NASA is working at the macro level. And we are working at the micro level to find a solution that is in line with what the, has been mentioned concerning protection about flooding, but in this case, it's about forest fires and ultra early warning. And so I'd like to introduce Dirmod. We are a consultancy that has been in the market for over 12 years, and it appears as a professional services consultancy. And we specialize in software development and cloud services and adding value to the processes, business processes of the organizations together with AWS. In this sense, my role as a CEO of the company is to bring these solutions to governments and non-governmental organizations so that we can promote a digital transformation in all the countries and seek to reach better services for the citizens a much more healthy and sustainable solution so that we can support sustainable development goals such as 
for, by the United Nations. So uh, I, we are very excited about our solution because it's really attacking a problem that is extremely important. We have some figures here that we should consider when we're talking about fires, which is 20% of the CO2 emissions at the world level are caused by forest fires. 80% of those fires are non-intentional fires, but were caused by human beings. So we are talking about avoidable catastrophes. We are talking, they are not accidents, but incidents. They have a root cause that is originates in the capacity that we can determine and prevent to with early warning and also with awareness of the communities. There's a big impact on biodiversity with over 3 mil, billion animals dead every year and the financial damage is extremely high. We're talking about $140 billion of economic loss at the world level. Uh, not only the catastrophe itself, but also the response. So if we see this, we will understand the importance of anything that we can do to approach the mission that we have in dry with Dryad to try to prevent uh, fires in an ultra early manner. Why ultra early? Because time is fundamental to reduce the impact and sometimes avoid it. Most of the systems that are used nowadays to try to work on the con prevention and containment of fires have to do with the solutions that we see on the right of the presentation, that is satellites and the cameras to try to capture that on site. And these have time scales that are longer because we're working on the images that detect the presence of fires that or changes that are significant enough to be detected and the technology that Dryad is leveraging seeks a different type of approach to detect in the latent combustion stage which is the first stage of every fire the possibility of it being produced and manifesting we are talking about between one and 60 minutes of starting and we'll with to do this we change the logic of how we work and instead of working with images this uh, iop and software and machine learning solution that allows us to detect the change of gas composition in the air and this is what we pick up as alerts to understand that is the beginning of a fire is starting to appear and so this is what we are seeking to do using the ultra early detection. This allows us to supervise large areas in a decentralized world with real time uh, warnings. And this reduces emerging damage and sometimes could nullify them if there is coordination with the government and early warning. Uh, early response system so that as to mitigate a lot of the costs that we saw earlier that have such a big ecological and economic impact. So the solution has three main components, the sensors, which are the elements that detect these gas composition changes that will be spread throughout the forest and the number of sensors depends on the density of the forest. Uh, we could say that the uh, sensor is needed every 100 meters or 500 meters in terms of surface. So this would be one sensor per hectare. And we need another element that is a gateway that will work on a network that is a very good technology for these types of situation because it allows us to work on connectivity on internet or by cable connectivity if we don't have connectivity with very low uh, energy per um, quantity of information. So they are very extremely inexpensive and have a long life. So the sensors and the gateways, we have two types of gateways, the network gateways that will make all these sensors be interconnected so that we will have uh, also be able to respond to the interconnections and they have a reach of five kilometers and will allow us to connect to internet so that this information is then sent to the supervision network uh, platform which will show us the deployment of the devices and the connection with 
the different response teams for all the green spaces that we wish to supervise, all the forests that we wish to supervise, one or many in different territories. So this could be used by supranational um, uh, bodies. And we can also review all the alerts that are then sent by email, SMS, or any other mechanism that we wish to use. And in addition to all this, as we are lifting data with the objective of fire prevention, we are also picking up a lot of other different data, which we are working to have consulting where will we be able to use all this information for scientific purposes uh which is also interesting for this webinar this is a diagram of how the deployment works and we will see that the sensors that show each one of the points where we can measure this gas composition points and have uh, with the border gateway are connected with the border gateways and the grid gateway set makes up the whole grid gateway at the big scale. This has different implementation stages. These are long-term projects because they require a component of machine learning for the adoption of the solution to adapt to the specific characteristics and the topology type and the type of forest in each place. So when we deploy the sensors during a period of between 10 and 30 days, these sensors start to capture a lot of information that is fed back to the machine learning and uh, teaches the sensor so that it ha has enough sensitivity for the task. And it can grow to a pilot uh, scale where we will have a greater number of sensors and in the about we can then go to a large scale and we are talking about projects with 10, 15 years of um, term that will work on the detection of forest, or real intentional or accidental fires. And we are working out here, we're talking about the length of time and the roadmap is, is important to tell you that we are now currently working with forest fires, but looking forward, this same solution will allow us to measure a lot of other things, such as fuel um, aspects and also sap um, flows it, uh, and sensors of humidity in the soil and to measure water reserves, etc. And it has a different uh, scenarios for application and there's a lot of development uh, surrounding the solution, which is very recent. And as we said before, the costs of forest fighting, uh, firefighting goes down. And this is an important solution that we think will affect humanity as a whole. And this is an example of how the installation of a POC would work and where we have to place the first 16 sensors and a network gateway and a grid gateway. And we will start to see the first results. And nowadays, we have the devices to do the first POCs. And we can say that this company is in Argentina with a presence in Chile and Mexico. In Argentina, we have had during 2022, a lot of forest fires and the first concept plants in one of the southernmost areas in Tierra del Fuego. And we will be doing it, we'll continue to do it in the future. And you can see how we will, this network is seen and you see the distributed sensors with distances that look equidistant. You can see that in the map, but this is how you build the grid on the surface. And in that way, we can continue to work on the roadmap to work on the solution. Another important point to consider is to compare this with the type of different solutions that are offered nowadays. And we can see here that the dryer technology has a much better uh, results for what we can do with the same technology. And in the case of the different uh, other technologies, the main factor that influences in the case of cameras, many times they have 
a deficient uh, functioning at night and a smaller radius of possibility of detecting because otherwise you need a, a lot more cameras with a bigger cost and the satellite also resolves things in a much slower way and these first hours are essential for minimizing the impact concerning fires in the implementation stages to tell you about how it works depending on the size of the forest you can do deployments of these solutions in a man manually we have done it with a pilot process a solution this is a solution that has been implemented in germany in England and Spain, and they were middle-sized forests, and we uh, calculate per day 32 devices that are implemented, and in a month, a medium-sized forest will be covered, and it can also be done with drones or parachutes, because the sensors are extremely resistant, so they can be thrown, and they will start to take connectivity as soon as they connect with any of the meshing uh, antennas and they can be deployed massively to implement the capacity or the scope in the same phase. So I tried to go fast so that I could be brief so that uh, we would have time for your questions. And this is a solution we wish to present today and I'm open to any questions that you may have written in the chat if we have time. Nicholas, thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. So we have time for one question. As I said before, if there are additional questions, we're going to answer them later on as well. One of the questions people are asking has to do with sensor density. I know this is the million dollar question. Uh, and we have conducted other, we have implemented other projects regarding early warning systems, people don't know how many sensors they need, etc. Is it one sensor per hectare, per 100 or 500 meters, or how does it work? And I know this is not a mathematical calculation, it includes topographic aspects and other aspects as well, but that's more or less a question. Well, let's start with the information, what we can say for sure. We know that depending on density, the solution is very effective if there's a distance between 100 uh, of between 100 and 500 meters. Um, that has to do with the density, depending on, on the number of trees in the forest, for instance. Density is different. It's different. You know, the canopy, canopy will uh, change the, the sensor line. So between, between 100 and 500 meters. And we need to remember that the value of each sensor is relatively low. So the solution uh, grows in volume in number of uh, sensors, but there are no, uh, the, the gateway use doesn't increase. And the number of sensors is not linear for each area. If you have a rural farm and you know to be cautious, it's one sensor every 100 meters, and that has always worked well. But in the forests, maybe uh, you don't need as many sensors. And that we can determine when we can experiment, have a look at the, at the area and provide an accurate case-by-case uh, -case, uh, quote. Thank you so much, Nicolas. Thank you for answering the questions and for accepting this invitation. Now I would like to give the floor to Chris Toner. Chris is part of the AWS system. He works in the open data, uh, AWS open data um, uh, team. He, he's an environmental open lead. Um, let's see, do we need to say something about the, the interpretation? Uh, yeah, have a look at this screen, please. There is the QR code if you need interpretation. If you want to listen to the presentation in Spanish, please go ahead and scan the QR code. The next presentation will be in English. So uh, if you need a Spanish translation, uh, you can have it, uh, you can access it through this uh, QR code. Uh, welcome, Chris. Hi, folks. Uh, I need to share my screen. There we go. OK. 
Okay, and you should see my slides. We can see it. Okay. And now with Perfect. the presenter mode, go ahead. Awesome. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Chris Stoner. I'm the Open Environmental Data Lead on the uh, AWS Open Data Program. So, I'm going to talk with you today a little bit about the Open Data Program, what it is, uh, and also about the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative, or ASDI. So, Open Data on AWS, um, uh, what is this program? So customers typically start on opendata.aws. Uh, that's the uh, short URL to get to our website. Um, and you can find two very important things on this website. Uh, you can find the registry of open data, which is the uh, uh, bubble in the center. Um, and you can also learn how to apply to the program. So there's sort of two different ways to look at open data. You can be a data producer, so you can produce a data set and contribute that data set to the program, but you could also be a data consumer uh, where you use data sets uh, in the program. Uh, the, so we have some great examples of both, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, so what is the program? It is, uh, it was started about 10 years ago. Uh, as a way to help researchers um, access data. We had a lot of researchers that came to us and said, uh, you know, it takes us about 80% of our time just accessing the data, uh, just fetching it. Um, and actually for myself, prior to joining AWS, I worked at the uh, ASF DAC, which is a NASA DAC. Uh, and we actually had uh, researchers mail gear to us and ask us to uh, download the files uh, for their research onto the these hard drives and then send them back to them. Uh, so, you know, everyone's trying to access this data as quickly as possible. If you put it into the cloud, then everyone can access the data all in one place uh, without having to wait to download. So the open data sponsorship itself, um, you know, as I said, it was started about 10 years ago and we've grown to over a hundred petabytes of data. Uh, the data for the most part is free and open to anyone for any purpose. I say for the most part because we do have some uh, health and genomics data and those data are, uh, are embargoed. Uh, there's, they're high re highly restricted due to HIPAA uh, and other um, uh, regulations. Uh, but if you are a data producer and you're putting data into the program, the program covers the storage costs. Um, the, by that, I mean the cost to have the data in the cloud as well as egress. If you're not familiar with egress, uh, it's free to put data into the cloud, but there is a nominal cost for every object that leaves uh, the cloud and is downloaded, uh, let's say, on premises or downloaded to your laptop. And we cover the egress costs as well. So the, the open data program is really a great way to get started uh, in the cloud. It's very low risk uh, and you get to know S3, uh, which is um, uh, uh, AWS Simple uh, Storage Service, which is basically just object storage in the cloud. Uh, you get to know that service right away and then easily start to branch out into identity and access management, which is really you know, security and access uh, into the cloud as well as compute. We do require a brand new AWS account uh, to store the data. Uh, that's really because we cover your costs. And to allow for frictionless access to the data, we don't allow a paywall or registration page. The data really has to be free and open. Um, and that's, that's really to encourage use within the research community um, uh, and, and provide a method for folks to be able to access data uh, without restriction. So I think Juan Carlos mentioned this as well in the very beginning, um, you know, sort of, we have a sort of flipped data flow. So the traditional approach would be sort of like my experience at ASF DAC, where we have uh, uh, computing resources on-prem and folks are asking to move the data to, to the computing resources. Let's say you have a, a supercomputer at your university and you wanna run um, high performance computing workloads on that supercomputer, you would download and wait days, hours, sometimes weeks to download all of the data for the scenes um, in order to start your analytics. In the cloud approach, the data is there and ready to be used. You simply use the computing resources that are co-located with the data. So you don't have to wait to download the data before you can start your analytics. 
Um, and, and this is really the purpose of uh, the open data program and also where ASDI comes in. So for the registry, um, we offer a couple of things. So there's a cloud formation template, which I'll mention also a little bit later, that sets up all the resources for you if you're a data producer. Um, if you're a data consumer, there's over 800 usage examples, tutorials, and publications. And if I have time today, and I hope I do, um, I'll actually uh, show you a SageMaker Studio Lab notebook um, and run an example of how to run some really simple compute in the cloud. And all of the data can be found at the registry of open data at registry.opendata.aws. And, and that's the 100 petabytes of data free and open uh, to anyone. So we talked about the open data program. So what is the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative? You can kind of think of the open data program as the storage side and ASDI as the compute side. Uh, so from the Sustainability Data Initiative, uh, we offer compute grants um, to either use the data that's already in the open data program or to create a new derived data set that would be contributed back to the open data program. These compute grants typically cover one year. Um, it's uh, not meant to be used for production workloads, but is meant to be used to sort of bootstrap your efforts, getting to know the cloud, building your first pipeline, uh, trying to understand how to cloud optimize a data set um, and do that at scale. The idea is to really advance knowledge and give folks um, uh, you know, an easy and again, low risk way to um, start doing compute in the cloud, especially with the resources uh, either in the open data program or contributing back to the open data program. All right, and at this point, I'm gonna stop with the slides and do a couple of demos. So I mentioned registry.opendata.aws. Uh, this is the registry of open data. So on the right-hand side, I have a scrolling list of data sets. And on the left-hand side, I can see hyperlinks that will get me to things like uh, collabs. Uh, so we have a, a quick links to get you to the list of data sets from NOAA, for example. And if I go back, I can also search. I can search based on tags, say air quality, and find a bunch of really good, cool data sets. Like OpenAQ is a, an exceptional one for air quality. But I'm actually going to search on NextRad. And uh, for NextRad, if you are a data producer, this is a really good example of how to get a data set into the open data program. Uh, there's uh, a lot of information here. Uh, there's documentation. There's also usage examples, and I'm going to run through the Studio Lab uh, example in a little bit. Uh, but there's also a bunch of resources over on the right. It shows you the type of data that you can fetch and different ways to fetch it. And I'll show you how to do that as a data consumer in a moment. But how do you create this page? Uh, so if I, we have a GitHub repo called the Open Data Registry. And there is a template YAML file. You'll see name, description, documentation. This YAML file really drives what you see on this page. See description, update frequency. It's really all the same fields. And in fact, if I go to data sets and I search on NextRad, you would simply create a pull request with um, these fields filled in. Uh, for example, you can see real-time and archival data from the next generation weather radar network, and that is exactly what's written here. So you can see that this file is driving what's in the registry. So you can really think of the registry as a catalog of all the data sets uh, available in the open data program. And the data producers, in this case, it was Unidata, which is a third party that works with NOAA. Um, they uh, submitted this, um, this uh, YAML file for NOAA, but we have tons of other data sets in here from NOAA and other providers. The GitHub repo is open to the public. Anyone can uh, make a submission. We do ask that you submit to the program first, but the idea is that it's open to anyone and anyone can uh, 
add a new uh, interesting data set to the registry. We also have an onboarding handbook, and this covers a lot of important information about how to prepare your data before you load it into the program. Uh, again, how to create that registry entry, um, creating the new account and linking it, um, and also some FAQs about how to upload data in the most performant manner. There's ways that you can um, specify the chunking for the files as you upload them to make it a little bit faster. Okay, so if I go back here and I start to think about this uh, from a data consumer, let's say I'm a researcher and I want to use some data in the program, there's a couple of ways I can look to see, you know, what's in uh, this uh, NextRad bucket. And I can browse the bucket right here in my web browser. And I'll see that the data is sorted by year, month, day. And then this is a ground station key. So NextRad is a network of 160 uh, ground radar sites uh, for NOAA. And so if I pick KBOX, for example, which is a particular ground radar station, um, you will see that there's data coming in roughly uh, every seven or eight minutes, um, every day, all, all the time. There's another way I can access this data using the CLI. So I'll just copy this uh, template command. And using the CLI, you can see it looks kind of similar, but there's this PRE in front. That just means prefix, which is another name for folder. So if I just add 2023 to the command, I will see uh, the months, January and February. I can drill down into January, January 31st, and add, what was it, KBOX. And I will see the same data that I saw through the web browser. So why did I show you this? Well, it's important to understand that everything at AWS is available, pretty much everything is available through an API. And why is that important? Well, you're going to want to do headless workloads where you have a pipeline that accesses data fetches it through an API and runs analytics without a human involved. And the way you would do that with NOAA NextRed is to use the, if you can find it, SNS topic. And this is the ARN or Amazon resource name for the SNS topic. So what you would do is you would subscribe to this topic if you are interested in this data set. As new data arrives in that bucket for any of the you can filter, but typically for any of the ground station keys for any date, um, you would receive a notification and then you could kick off workloads, fetch the data um, and, and immediately start your processing again without any human intervention, simply by listening to the uh, simple notification service topic. All right. And the other cool thing I wanted to show you is SageMaker Studio Lab. So when we ask uh, data providers to um, provide their data set, we want them to create uh, tutorials and tools and applications really just to get folks bootstrapped and started in the cloud. And one of those are SageMaker Studio Lab notebooks. So what's SageMaker Studio Lab? Well, it's, um, it's a Jupyter notebook server. Uh, you get 12 hours of CPU or four hours of GPU per day. I've actually been running this one since earlier this morning. You don't need an AWS account uh, to use SageMaker Studio Lab. You will need an account, however. Um, you can see that I've created one, but that's really just to persist your state. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, I actually don't need an AWS account to fetch data from the registry. This important no sign request. Um, when you access the data using the CLI, you can say, even if I have an AWS account ID and credentials, don't send them. Uh, with my list command, um, I, I want to browse anonymously. Um, so we don't even require an AWS account to use uh, the Open Data Registry. You don't need an AWS account to use SageMaker Studio Lab, though you would once you graduate um, up into uh, SageMaker Studio. But SageMaker Studio Lab, think of it as a free Jupyter Notebook server, really for testing, kicking the tires, uh, getting to know uh, these data sets. So for this one, we would click the Copy to Project button 
Now the data, the, the Jupyter Notebook server um, is already ready to go. I've already cloned this entire repo, which is what you would do here at the root. So it's already canned in this particular instance and it's gonna tell me that. Um, but you would say clone the entire repo and yes to build the Conda environment. Again, it's gonna say it's already there which just saves us some time. It's a little bit of time to pull in the libraries. So what, what did all that just do? Uh, basically using this YAML, uh, this environment YAML, uh, we, we first pulled the entire GitHub repo um, and I'll show you where this repo is. There's a bunch of samples that are available. Again, they're open to the public. Um, uh, this was actually created by a customer and we simply made it work on SageMaker Studio Lab. Um, but we use this environment YAML really to tell Conda, here's all the libraries I want you to go ahead and, and pull into this environment. Uh, once that completes, we make sure we're running the right kernel. And then you simply start uh, uh, running the notebook. And you can see that as I walk through these lines, uh, it goes from an asterisk to a number as it's processed the line. And what's important about this one is that we're using and showing you how to use uh, the Bado uh, library to get a connection to S3, grab a hold of that same NOAA NextRad level two bucket I was talking about earlier. And I'm gonna grab some data from May 20th of 2011 with the ground station key KVNX. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and plot some precipitation. This is a really quick and easy way. I'm using the data in situ. I'm pulling very little from S3 in order to run this analytics. And this is gonna run a much longer set of data. This is a um, uh, from 2016, October 6th. This, I'm pulling data from uh, Hurricane Matthew. Um, in this example, it's a much larger set of data over a larger area of interest, uh, but this was a particularly uh, powerful uh, hurricane that uh, devastated Haiti as well as the uh, uh, southeast U.S. Uh, and, a, and a couple of other areas as well. It's a very large hurricane. Um, and I thought it might be neat to show you. Uh, again, we have a bunch of samples. Um, they're, they're free and open to the public and we can provide links to everything I've shown you here today. And here I can stop and we can go back for questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, one question. I understand that um, the AWS Data Exchange was recently launched. Uh, do, do you mind uh, sharing what is the difference between the Data Exchange and the Open Data? For sure. Systems? So you can think of uh, the Open Data Program as data that's free and open to the public. Uh, uh, again, we cover the cost of storage in uh, AWS Data Exchange. This is a way for uh, a, a small startup, um, a, an AWS partner, um, or even a, a large agency uh, to cover its costs or possibly um, work in a commercial subscription with um, uh, data consumers. So uh, basically on ADX, it's built on top of AWS Marketplace. Um, you can sell your data set. Uh, you can list it there uh, for a subscription. There are similar methods for notification so that users that have subscribed and are paying for that data set uh, can get data as soon as it arrives uh, in the bucket. ADX also offers a couple of other methods. Uh, Redshift access, for example, you can share a Redshift table and a couple of other things that the Open Data Program simply doesn't provide today. We only provide um, sharing uh, through an S3 bucket. Uh, so uh, your uh, open data registry entries also show up in ADX now. Um, that allows folks who want to find data, um, both data that's free and open and data that they have to pay for, they can search for it in one place in the ADX catalog. And in fact, um, I guess it's a little cumbersome to go all the way back, but if you look at the registry, there's a blue bar at the very top, uh, and that was the announcement that uh, we're integrated with ADX. You can click the link and actually go to ADX and browse through there as well. Uh, and the last one, uh, because uh, we're close to being over time, uh, but uh, you, uh, you showed us SageMaker. How do we learn more about uh, SageMaker and other ML or artificial intelligence uh, uh, tools? Yes, awesome. So there's a couple and, of and links. Any free resources and all that is. 
For sure. There's two links I'll post into the chat. One is AWS samples. Um, there are a bunch of samples that we created for Remars last year. Um, they are SageMaker Studio Lab uh, specific, so they're uh, small and constrained and can run on a SageMaker Studio Lab instance, which is much smaller than what you would get in uh, the, the Big Brother uh, SageMaker. But there's also some much larger SageMaker uh, notebooks in there as well. These are free and open to the public. Um, feel free to you know, steal that code and start from there. That's the purpose uh, of providing them. And I'll post that into the chat. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris, uh, for posting those and, of course, uh, sharing your time with us and ensuring more about uh, uh, the, the, the initiatives uh, that you are leading. No worries. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Stoner, for sharing this information with us. So this is the end of our meeting. Thank you for staying with us today. Um, we will be sharing a, a contact email with you. Um, hopefully, this the idea was to have a you know a short webinar. The idea was to whet our appetite regarding tools and cloud users that have to do with the academia and research. And research. Um, you can, of course, contact Camila Saad. Please have a look at the screen in order to follow up on our experts, Ricardo, Jose Luis, Nicolás, or Chris, in order to find out a bit more about the Open Data Initiative. Before we close, we should uh, summarize the cloud benefits again. Um, uh, we heard Ricardo speak about this and, you know, some people might say uh, this, this is NASA stuff, uh, but actually the cloud is very good because it is a democratizing agent, you know, cloud technology, AWS technology can be used by NASA and by all uh, the others institutionally or individually. This is another one of the benefits that we have through the cloud. And another one is that we are uh, have a lot more access. All these repository, not only of open databases that Chris mentioned, but also other lots of other tools such as the SysMaker and others, uh, AI and machine learning that we are available so that we can test and make changes. So we would like to thank very much. I would like to thank Marco Reyes da Silva, the director of the AIA. And thank you, Marco Sirene and all your team of the Institute for supporting this initiative. And we are available for any questions you may have.